because we were so thrilled, I think, to be going on Sunderland, we walked down to the edge of the water where one or two had been pulled out of the water up slipways. They had sort of beaching gear that you could bolt onto the side. People used to go in waders, so, uh, uh, sort of fitters and riggers go in waders to fix these things to the side, and then a little trolley would go into this bit at the back, and they'd pull them up, sometimes with a tractor, really, out to service them. And... Uh, we went and looked at the size of about three or four London buses high I mean, on this beaching gear. So we thought, well, they're, 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 this is certainly going to be different, but if we can fly the Oxford, we can fly anything. Uh, well, uh, it was very big for a start with. It was very big. In fact, uh, I've got a picture of uh, one of them up the slip on, um, at Wig Bay near Stranraer. And uh, we've got a double-decker bus going under the wings, actually. So it, it was a big aircraft, and um, it was heavy. And, um, yes, it was much heavier than the Catalina. And, uh, you know, getting it up on the step and that was, you know, it was, it was quite a, a business, really. Well, I was quite impressed. I'd never seen one before. I really was impressed, and when I went on board one, I was impressed with the size of it, you know, and the, the space inside it. I, I often wondered how I was going to cope with it, you know, working on the water, but you learn. It's surprising how quickly you learn. Oh, I loved it as an aircraft, you know, I, everything about it I loved. Uh, you just went aboard it and you felt at home on it. It was one of those things that, and there was, because it carried quite a few crew, you were always in company and it was, there were great company, there were some quite witty blokes and, and the banter that used to go on at times, it was, it was just a lovely feeling. I was, it was, it was lovely to be part of it. I, that's what that's what I did love about flying more than anything, you know. The you were part of a team and they were all friends. Although you got officers and sergeants and different ones in the crew, they were all friends. Well, a Sunderland flying boat. Anybody that was posted to flying to doing his duties in a Sunderland flying boat just thought that n nothing could ever be better than this um, the crews generally speaking were all highly experienced crack crews um, a very very high standard um, the flying boat itself was a beautiful aircraft it, it flew well and um, uh, we had um, bunks on board where we could uh, um, sleep if we wanted to, and they did have to sleep um, in those bunks because when we took off in the morning, at 6 o'clock in the morning, there had to be crews on board guarding that boat all night long because it was it was bombed up. It, you know, there was all the ammunition on board and there was depth charges on board, and so it had to have people on board it. And then they had to take off at six o'clock and do, and do another duty, um, and and uh, that in itself was quite onerous. So there were bunks on board, and if you wanted a rest, I couldn't have a rest because I was the only navigator. So I was always on duty when I was on board. So it didn't happen to me that way. But we had a, a wardroom where we had breakfast and um, we had cooked meals. We had cooking apparatus on board. Um, there was a flush toilet on board, and it was very spacious. Um, you know, quite a lot of these aeroplanes, you, you have to crawl about in them to, to get into your position. And But with the Sunderland, you could walk in, head up, and uh, loads of room. Absolutely marvellous. Uh, it was really a fantastically uh, pleasant aircraft. Or general handling and accuracy, I suppose you would call it. Um, you had 
You usually threw them on patrol, of course, anti-submarine patrol, averaged about 10 to 15 hours, as well as convoy escorts. And uh, you could fry them for that time without using any automatic pilot, no trouble at all. You had a, a, a first pilot, of course, captain of aircraft, and a second pilot, and sometimes a third pilot under training with the rest of the crew of uh, 10 or 12. Um, we carried no parachutes because there was no point in doing so. You normally flew at about um, 500 feet because you flew higher. If there were any submarines at periscope depth, they could spot you at how you were and further away. So if you were about 500 feet, you were able to sort of more or less camouflage your arrival if you were lucky enough to spot one. <coughs> I think it was very useful because if you're in the area and uh, suddenly a U-boat has spotted you, it's not going to stay on the surface. It's going to go as far away as possible. And this uh, prevention is uh, a very high order. We were up for about an hour, and he landed. And then as he landed, he turned around and taxied. And he, I was standing between the first and second pilot, because we had to in those days, when you're on test flight, you had to watch the, the uh, boost and the engine revs and so forth. And he said, now we'll do some real flying. And he put that boat through all sorts of turns and twists. He dived it, he climbed it, he banked it. And then when he landed, he said, how did you enjoy that? I said, I never thought our Sunderland could do that. He said, I used to be a test pilot for Sunderlands because they were the original Empire flying boats. As a matter of fact, I worked on one of the Empire flying boats, the Golden Hind. It has two de decks and a bilge, that is to say the... the uh, under part of the fuselage has a bilge like a boat has that, uh, that you just have to pump water out of really and then it has two decks uh, one is the sort of flight deck at the top that has that has the first and second pilot and the navigator and the wireless operator and then down below there are uh, there was an anchor room at the, at the front where you had a winch uh, a lot of nav uh, naval stuff really, uh, and a natural anchor and, and mooring gear, a boat hook, etc. Then there was a little lavatory, a yacht lavatory, and uh, then there was a little staircase up to the to the flight deck, and then behind that was the wardroom, which, I mean, we used it gen as a general, perhaps the Navy thought of it as a wardroom where the officers went. Then there was a, a galley, which had... Uh, a cooker with two primer stoves and a sink and dish racks and so on, all thought up by yachting people or people who knew their naval uh, ways of, of, of uh, fitting out all the stowage you get in, 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 in ships and marine craft. Uh, and they had uh, little ga uh, things that you could, had drogues in, so you could put a drogue that opened up in the water and kept you from swinging too much to the right if you had this problem with winds and tides when you were approaching a, a mooring up boy. Uh, and then behind that was a, a sort of bomb room in which you had uh, stores of uh, depth charges and they were, ra they, they were pulled up electrically onto a lift of electric winches onto sort of bomb racks and then big doors in the side of the fuselage were pulled in and dropped down and the racks ran out quite quickly really and uh, so you could suddenly have the ability to, uh, to attack a, uh, a submarine uh, with them and a thing that I was quite impressed by was that on one side of the aircraft this bomb door ha had a, an extra section uh, uh, below it which was bolted on but the bolts could be undone and it made the bomb door so much bigger that a whole spare engine 
could be lifted up on these ra racks that normally took depth charges and then run into the inside and lowered and taken out. Well, they, these came into their own in the Far East when some chap... One, it once happened on this Chindwin River thing where they helped the Chindits by flying people out of there. That one of the engines failed, so they flew a spare engine up. I mean, it, 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 it was all done by, I think, yachting enthusiasts who uh, wanted to be self-sufficient. They wanted, apart from getting petrol, they wanted, which you have somehow had to get, you could sort of land on an island and uh, cook yourself and moor up yourself and then get a spare engine and so on. It was, uh, but it must have been thought out. Well, well back into the 30s or before I was born possibly as a way of adapting the old empire flying boats for military use and I I gave them full marks I mean an American Catalina which I've flown in had a lot of interesting ideas but I think the Sunderland surpassed the Catalina in many ways after the bomb room there was the, the last uh, place with two bunks and there that was the pyrotechnic storage and there was a, a ladder up there which would take you through to, and over the beam in, onto the bridge. Uh, they were all no, naval terms. And, uh, halfway up the catwalk uh, from the, uh, the, the last load of bunks, there was a, a flare chute. And you unscrewed a little panel, just half a turn, lift it out and you put the flare chute down and then you could put a flare in there and, and prime it and drop it and that uh, that was how they used the flares and uh, of course when we started flying the drill was well we had when I was flying we had 12 on our crew we had three pilots we had one navigator, we had two flight engineers, that was one flight engineer and one flight mechanic engines, FME, and then we had four wireless operators, one wireless operator mechanic, a WOM, and three um, other wireless operator air gunners, uh, WAP AGs, <coughs> And then we had two st straight AGs. They always called them straight AGs because they hadn't got any other trade, but it didn't mean they shot any straight. <laughs> and uh, so that was it. And what we, we did when we flew, the skipper used to fly for probably the first two hours. After the first hour, um, uh, we weren't allowed to smoke for the first hour. Uh, after the first hour, I always remember one of my WAP AGs, he always used to call up and say, permission to smoke, skipper? And so i then call up the engineer, flight engineer, and say, you know, uh, he would say, OK, so I'd say, permission to smoke, you see. <laughs> that was a great relief for a lot of these people. Um... Then the, the skipper would probably fly for another hour and then he would move into the second pilot's seat uh, and the second pilot would go into the captain's seat and fly the aircraft and the second pilot, the first pilot, the captain, would be looking out over the, you know, scanning the thing with binoculars, just looking for see what you could see and um, similarly we, we had this watch system that every hour everybody sort of changed around like the rear gunner would probably come up to the mid upper turret or he would go into the galley and, uh, and do the cooking and that was the sort of thing and they switched and some of them went into the front turret and um, 
So every hour, people changed positions. The spare pilot was really supposed to help the navigator out with his navigation. But I never knew a self-respecting navigator that would ever let a pilot anywhere near his charts. So that the poor navigator really did a full, complete stint. You know. Well, there was a system devised that I was another thing that I was amazed at in, in the Air Force. Uh, it, it was called a thing called the Coastal Command Navigation Drill, and it was devised by a man called uh, PMS Blackett, who was a professor at Manchester University and allegedly a communist or very left wing, as a lot of uh, intellectuals and academics were at that time probably quite understandably really and uh, but at any rate he, he, he became part of the or perhaps the head of the operational research unit of <coughs> I think of coastal command and uh, he worked out this drill and all it amounted was so simple and yet it was a marvellous thing because we use it a lot in the far east uh, you, you could do a, a dead reckoning uh, course, sort of your, your, your uh, heading, your course and your, uh, the working out the wind as I've described and then getting your track and every hour you'd say well my dead reckoning position is there but at the same time or just a bit before you'd take some shots on stars which would give you another position there and you, you could also take radio bearings or a thing called Loran which is long range air navigation which used sort of ma uh, master stations and slave stations giving, uh, by the, by giving a mark on a specially drawn chart of how long it took for the transmission to reach you. It was all done on an oscilloscope and that would give you intersecting cuts on these things that would give you this Loran position. But what Mac Blacker did was say after one hour that is your dead reckoning, this is your uh, astro navigation this one is your Loran system, but all of them will have an error. Each will, some errors will increase with time, like the dead reckoning one, since you left Madras or somewhere. But others will be standard errors, and you drew a circle of these errors. They might not intersect. Either they intersected or they almost intersected. But between it all, you get a, a, put a point that was the MPP, the most probable position. It was so simple, really. All of these things weren't quite right, but one was the most probable. Then you'd start again from that most probable for the next hour. And you could fly, we fl used to fly across the Bay of Bengal very, very slowly, about 90 knots. No, nothing to guide us, really, except for this Loran thing. And, uh, and, and you'd come bang out on, on some island, really. I thought, this man in Manchester is a flipping genius, this... Uh, communist who'd been uh, sort of rather run down as somebody who wasn't really with us on the, on the right side or something. At any rate, I, I was always impressed by this coastal command navigation drill. We normally kept our own aircraft, that was the one thing. Later uh, in the war they started swapping them around, but normally you kept your own aircraft so that when uh, the Air Force was serviceable, you were flying operations and um, when it had come to the end of its sort of service career, needed to come up to the slip for a major service, then you had some leave, you see, that's the way they worked it. Well, there's one famous recorded incident um, a boat in my squadron, in fact, which was attacked over the North Sea by, I think it was eight, Yonkers 88s. And it was a subject of a marvellous cartoon on the tap at the time, but uh, the Sunderland successfully defended itself against the uh, eight German aircraft. There was a rear gunner, there was a mid upper turret um, wireless operator air gunner, um, there was a front gunner in the in the nose. Um, it was there were twelve twelve guns. We had twelve guns on board, and it was nicknamed the Flying Porcupine 
because if if everybody had stuck a gun out of of the, of the window or stuck guns in position, um, there were twelve guns there, and there were there were about three free guns um, uh, down the side of the aircraft. Uh, if you were in combat, you could pull that down, and I could go down and pick up a handheld gun, and we could have we could we could we could must have bought fifteen guns uh, to defend ourselves if we wanted to. Initially, we had uh, a front gun turret which had two Browning 303s. The subs started to um, uh, fight back, and uh, usually they would just dive if you came in on them, but, but they started to fight back. And so we had four fixed gun positions in the um, in the nose of the aircraft, which the captain could press by brus- pressing the tit on the joystick on the control column, and um, we also had waist positions where we had uh, guns, uh, cannons. I think we had point fives actually, well point five uh, from each waist position. So we had quite a lot of armament. Uh, I'm talking about later when we got Sunderland Fives, which was so much better. Uh, and we had a mid-upper turret, which also had two Browning 303s. And we had a rear turret, which had four Browning 303s. And the, the racks had eight step charges, four each side, and two bombs. I'm not sure whether they're 250 or 500 pounders. They were about, I, I think they'd be about 250. And you used to carry spares, because if, if you had to use the, drop the depth charges, there was a panel either side. You just lifted it and it come down, and then you pressed a button and the bomb racks went out under the wings and they were ready to drop bombs then. The idea was to come, you, you, the method of attack was you came down to sea level, about 50 feet. And, um, I mean, the sub is usually periscope level, they all just gone below. And um, you would come down to 50 feet, and uh, the idea was you uh, dropped... Um, you had them, there was a thing that spaced the distance between them. I think they called it the Mickey Mouse thing. And uh, you, it spaced the thing between the depth charges. And um, usually you had them about 50 f- um, feet apart. And uh, so the idea was that if you got a straddle, between the first and second, or the second and third, you'd got a kill, that was the sort of thing. And we had a thing called a rear, a rear-facing automatic camera, which, as soon as you press the tit to release the depth charges, this camera started working. Uh, and so it showed the position of the straddle. But unfortunately, the time we sank a sub, the uh, damn thing wasn't working, so we didn't get a position of the straddle, but we did get a picture of the uh, of the actual um, handheld camera, took pictures of the bubbles coming up and German plotting charts and all that sort of thing, so it was confirmed as a kill. That initially was the Mark III Sunderland, which didn't have the reliable, the peg, had the Pegasus engines, which didn't have the same reliability <coughs> as they did later on, as the Catalina had. Uh, but um, they, they were a very nice aircraft to fly. It was much more comfortable than the Catalina because you got more room. Well, they were all right. They had the same flying characteristics as the the later one. It was just that uh, they didn't have the reliability that uh, one of the 
worst occasions was if you had a port in a failure, or you couldn't feather the props on the old on the old um, Mark III Sunderlands, so that uh, if the if the engine seized, you got all the air wanting to turn the prop, and it would occasionally it has happened you, it would, the, one of the blades would fly off, and of course it could could fly into the skipper's position if you uh, I'm happy to say that didn't happen to me <laughs> well two people would work on the outside of the engine either side of the engine and one person would work behind the engine in the engine in the cell sometimes uh, you, you'd get there were Pegasus engines they were Peggy and uh, you'd get you'd get uh, piston rings going. You had to take the the pot off. There was nine cylinders. You'd take the cylinder off, and then you'd take the broken ring out, put a new one on, put a sleeve around it, and gradually get get the pot back on. And then that, that was a job to support in the pot and putting the nuts on, and tightening them up. And but, you would do that all by hand, would you? Yes. Laying on the plank, if it was the bottom, the bottom one, he'd be laying down and supporting this and trying to put nuts on to hold it up. It's quite. It, it was. It, it sounds difficult, and, and when you first started, it was difficult. But after a while, you adapted, and and uh, it was no bother. And let's face it, in those days, flying. When it was exciting, you ne you never knew whether you, when you got in a plane, whether you were going to come back or not, because they weren't always as uh, as efficient engines as they are now. Well, you you always knew there was an element of danger with them because the uncertainty. Uh, they, 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 we never had the problem in Egypt with the engines, but we certainly did down in Africa. Because the humidity was so high, and they, they just used to seize up the engines. The valves used to seize up and cut the engine out. Oh yes, many of the time we came back with an engine cut out or two engines cut out. I've been on Sunday when three engines failed. We were flying. We were flying to Madagascar. We had a load of injured injured personnel on board, you know, and sick people. And uh, they were Catalina people, funny enough. And first one engine cut out, and it, it was due to this humidity and the valve seizing up. Then the second en engine came out, and the, the third cut out, and, and we dropped and dropped and dropped, and we, we were very low over the ocean. And when we got to Talia, there was a bit of a, a high rise to get into the harbour there. And I said, I said to the skipper, I said, push it right through the gate because you could, the four engines, you, you push them up to the maximum, but in an emergency, there was a, a gate you could push them through. I said, push it right through the gate. And it, it climbed enough to get over and it, just as we got over, the engine cut out and we glided into the harbour. I never forgot that. That was in, in, in Talia. And these, the Catalina people, they said they'd never fly in a Sunderland again. <laughs> I'm surprised, though, that it would fly on one engine. Oh, they will. They will. But... Uh, we never had the problem with it when they put the American engines in.